Hi, you're listening to After Dinner Conversations, short stories for long discussions. What that means is we get short stories, we select those short stories, and then we discuss them specifically about the ethics and the morality of the choices the characters and the situations put us in. Uh, why did you do this? What makes you do this? What makes us good people? What's the nature of truth, goodness, all of that sort of stuff? Uh, and hopefully we're all better, smarter people for it and, uh, and learn a little bit about why we think the way we think. So thank you for listening. Okay, after some technical issues, welcome uh, back once again to After Dinner Conversation, short stories for long discussions. I am your co-host, Colby, here with Jeremy. Hello. And Sarah. Hello. Um, And before I forget, uh, we just finished up the writing contest. We do it like twice a year. Uh, The winner gets published. Uh, Actually, one of the really great stories we had was one of the winners. Um, The Waiting Room was one of the winners like two ago. At any rate, so they just got announced. I thought I'd mention them. It's The Growing and Weeding of Dandelions by Tim Sharp was our big winner. Um, and then the honorable mentions were Clandestine by W. Goodwin, The Hitler Question by Noreen Graff. You can imagine what that's about. Bloodhound by Chris Preston, who's I think had something published with us before. And Prometheus Bound in ISS by Darren Shotepelz. <laughs> um... Any she rate, learned those how to are pronounce on, that one first. That was, yeah. It's really, actually, his is one of, his was really good. They were all really good. So we'll probably publish all five of them, or at least three or four of them. Um, so they'll, you know, they'll work their way in by next, and probably by January of next year. They'll uh, be in the publication. Um, which reminds me, you can get the publication. It's our monthly magazine. It's $1.99 a month, or $4.99 for the first year, if you use the discount code HAPPY. Uh, and then 1995 every year after that. You can do that on our website, afterdinnerconversation.com. And they're on Amazon and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Sorry, I'm just a little stressed because of our freaking technology. Uh, uh, anyway, so let's do this. Um, we've got some stories, eh? Hey. Hey. Uh, the first one, <laughs> Guilt Edge Security by James A. Hartley. Uh I, I, somebody mentioned that we, we didn't read these stories ahead of time. Not only do like, I don't know about you guys, but not only do I read them, but I usually read them like at least twice, if not three times. Yeah, uh, definitely read them. Yeah. Read them. Doesn't mean I always totally understand it, but, uh, but I always totally read it. Um, at any rate. Okay. So our story, uh, do either one of you guys want to discuss this or you want me to do it? It's up no, to you. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, a, so what's the story about? It is, uh, oh, it's about life. Uh, this is the guy who uh, gets sold the bottle of life, right? I'm making sure right. I'm remembering correctly. Okay, yeah. So the guy sits at a bar. He's on the outer edges of the universe. Guy comes down and says, I'll buy you a drink. And he's like, ah, you're trying to pitch me. You look like a salesperson. You are a salesperson-y kind of guy. You got the salesperson shirt, the salesperson haircut. And the guy- And the briefcase. And the briefcase, it's right. And he just sort of eases in. And he's like, as long as you're buying me free drinks, I will listen, listen. To, your, I'll listen to your stupid pitch. And then I'm going to get up and go home. Because I'm a salesperson too, and I know what you're doing. But the sales pitch is clever. The sales pitch is like I'm working on the outer rim because it's like a you know space futury thing, faster than light travel. Um, and there are these horrible people that have got this one good invention, but they're horrible people. So they needed someone else to sell it to the world. So uh, I would sell them technology. They would pay me in this elixir called life. Um, and like after the second or third one, they basically had me. And so now I just work for them, uh, because he's like 250 years old or something now still looks like he's in his forties or fifties. Right. Um, and so the guy is like, really, that's amazing. Why don't they market it to everybody? And he's like, oh, that's not really the way it works. He's like, but I'll give you a sample and I'm going to be coming back through here in eight years. So he gives the guy the sample, doesn't try and sell him anything. And the story ends up eight years later, the guy is back at the same bar waiting for the salesman to show up to know how he can, like, get more. Um, and there's this whole thing I, that I didn't really catch when I wrote the questions, but I definitely caught it this time, about sort of free will and choice. Um, how and, and, and how a soul is tied to your ability to make choices, which we've talked about before, right? right. That, like, as soon as... 
you can make a choice, you can make a wrong choice, which means you now have sort of something like morality maybe or something mm -hmm. like ethics because if there is a choice, then there's a ch always the choice you shouldn't take. Um, and so he's saying like, look, now that I'm you're, now that you're hooked on it, they, you've lost, the implication I think is you've lost your soul because you've lost your choice because you're never going to give this up. Um, right. Anyway. And, I, and I think the, the salesman was basically giving the, him that as a disclaimer to begin with. It's like, oh, hey, I'm yeah. trying to save you, man. Like you should walk but away. But I got to tell you this anyways. Yeah. That's interesting. I hadn't even thought about that. That's a good point. It is kind of like a disclaimer, isn't it? He talks about integrity and all. he's like, do you believe in integrity? And the guy's like, what kind of pitch is this? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that is kind of the disclaimer. I don't know. Sarah, what would you think? Um, I, oof. Yeah. The salesman was kind of, well, they're both salesmen, right? Yeah. How do salesmen sell salesmen? That's I the question. I found this one really hard to wrap my brain around. I liked, I enjoyed the discussion about um, how when you can live for centuries, life becomes somewhat disposable. Mm. And so the population grows and people are, there. there's so many people and life is so long mm -hmm. and abundant that it's easy to throw people away. It, mm. it kind of feeds into the cruelty of the society that really enjoys owning things and they own each other. And I, I liked that part of the story yeah. a lot. I feel like, um, you know, there's a lot of thought that we put into when we're talking about longevity and what would society be like if people could live forever. Yeah. And how would we be different as a society if there was no end date? Yeah. How do we um, value things differently? Right. Like, yeah. would it would it make us better? Mm. You know? It could. There's always that potential, you know, it always it still comes back to what choices we have. Right. You know, and, and the idea that whenever you have too much of anything, it becomes disposable. You know, or really the value of that drops. And that includes people. Yeah. You know, in overpopulated countries, it's the same way where right. the people become disposable. Right, because there's so many of them and there's so little value of them. They're just everywhere. Yeah. So right. why is it that increased longevity devalues life so much? Is it just because it makes the, the population expand so much? The, you're right. That would be one way to look at it. If, the, if nobody's ever dying, then all you're doing is adding to people. You know, and even Tolkien talked about this. The, the, the elves lived for a really long time, so they had very few kids. So, you know, right. they adjusted for that, um, you know, and as a society, you would have to do the same thing mm. to some extent if, you know, if, if that's what was going on. Yeah, I wondered because I, I feel like this was the same thing uh, that came up in um, and I didn't read the books because I'm not a 15 year old girl, but the interview of the vampire books. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Those weren't for fifteen-year-old girls. You're thinking, yeah, the I'm thinking, other ones. I'm thinking Twilight. But I feel like yeah. Interview with the Vampire was the same way. I say that having never read it, <laughs> um, but I saw the movie. And I think one of the things that that I remember about those movies and the idea behind it is how would you treat your life differently if you thought in the war, if you thought in the, the way of centuries rather than years? Yeah. Um, one, I think. And I don't know. It's an interesting question. It's a question that I think gets posed periodically in science fiction. Um, and the idea of making people more disposable is the opposite of what I would think. Because I would think if I knew I was going to live a thousand years, then maybe driving a car is too great of a risk. Because if the risk is one in a hundred thousand, well, in a 60-year lifespan, all right, I'm going to be in two or three reasonable wrecks. But in the course of a thousand-year lifespan... Boy, eventually, I'm going to roll the wrong dice. Um, and that's so I feel like it would, it would cause more conservative choices. Oh, that's a really interesting. I don't yeah. think anybody, at least anything I've ever read, has addressed that. Yeah, I don't know. And the other thing, because I've thought about this a fair bit. I mean, I wrote a character in, it that, in, a, in a book about this. Uh, is I also wonder how you would value things in relationships, like how time would feel. Right. Because, like, I don't make my bed uh, because just every day I'd have to make my bed. And the bed never, like, 
and four hours later or eight hours later or ever 12 hours later, I'm going to be back and make him the bed messy again. So like why burn time <laughs> on something that has such a short payback? Right. So just don't do it. And if you start thinking in longer and longer terms, could a three-week period be too short of a payback? Could a, It's like the way old people never seem to like get new fashion. Because in my mind, their opinion is – this is just my made-up opinion – like, look, like I was in fashion. It changed. I was in fashion again. It changed. Am I really going to go buy a different shirt again? Because in eight years, I'm going to have to buy a different shirt again. And this one is just fine. Right. And this one's just fine. And so I feel like that's why old people to tend not to adjust to fashion and trends as much. Because it just comes too fast. And they see things too long. I can see that. Um, answering my own question. Yeah, let's hear it. I think in science fiction... Um, and fantasy, when you have immortality, it also comes with some level of indestructiveness. Right. Um, and so not only are vampires immortal, but they can't be killed. Oh, yeah. That's why they probably don't value it the same way. That's right. And yeah. so looking – and that's why that question doesn't get asked. But if you, mm. you just live for a thousand years, but you have the same fragility that yeah. humans have, yes, I think that would change on an individual level what our choices would be. But I think the point of this was that once you have too many people who live a thousand years. Right. Then life becomes disposable. From a societal or from a government standpoint. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. I Not feel like in an individual sense. I feel like we've had a, stories or discussions about how governments might deal with that problem. About um, sort of you have to have, someone has to die in order for, to get permission for someone to be born. Yeah, blah, I think blah, blah, there was blah. another story yeah. about that, wasn't but there? The, or? I don't know, but those but those also assume that you're stuck on the same planet, right? That you can't be sort of an intergalactic cl- colonizer. Right. Do you think he would get sick of working? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like this guy's been at this. He's 206 years old, he says, and he's been at this forever. So yeah. that, you know, but he has talking to about governments. We yeah. retire at some point, and we look to our government to take mm-hmm. care of us in a certain sense like you know we have the social security thing ideally here <laughs> <laughs> social work right for retirement sure there are certain social safety nets for the aging population sure if your population does not age and kind of lives forever yeah i mean he's saying 500 it's, years yeah it, again it's going to depend on i don't know it's there's a lot to a lot of things to d- discuss about how a society would evolve with this kind of change. Yeah. Because um, governments would change how they deal with people. Businesses would have to change how they deal with people. And, you know, it would give you the opportunity to, as an individual, like, yeah, you could have this kind of career for 50 years and then move on to something else. Right. Like, I'm done doing what I'm doing. I want to now go be a musician. Well, or the, now I want to go be a doctor. Or, yeah, you know, after already having a career, if you don't age and you don't, right, you know, don't ever die. You right. Like, there's no, there's no, there's, there's no age too late to go get a PhD. Right. Um, the good life. Right. No, the good place. The oh. good place. At the very end, once they were all in the the real heaven that they built, um. Whatever the one of them was, just suddenly becoming the expert on everything through the centuries. Like, yeah, now I'm going to be the perfect chair builder. Or oh, that's right. And he spent like an eternity learning to build it the was perfect chair. I remember the, Chidi, Chidi, not Chidi. The other it was the woman. Oh, um, Eleanor. No, no the, the the Indian woman. Indian woman. Oh, jeez. Yeah, I don't remember the names. Anyway, we need to watch the show again because we were starting yeah. to forget people's names. <laughs> it's You're such right, a good she show. did. She went to go be the yeah. expert in everything. But right. the, see, the thing is, there has to be an end. I feel like that was part of the point. There is an end in this story, though. I mean, you do only get 500 years. Sure. It's just a lot. It's just a lot. I feel well, like you I, get a little bit bored. The interesting thing, you talk about retirement, though, but I think the salesperson, he doesn't get to retire because the way he earns the medicine is by selling it. So right? is this really like a – it's a big pyramid scheme. I think like it you is. You only get the life by now Getting- – by selling so it to are, other people. How are they selling it? I think they're I think it is a pyramid scheme. I think it's a so pyramid scheme. So you can't sch- get it unless you're in the unless you're in the fight club. Yeah. Is the so only I way think, you can So I think this is the genius of 
to me, this was the genius of this story. And I may have been projecting my own thoughts into it. So I'm curious to what you guys think. Because he talks a little bit about like what happens when you have when a country or a planet in this case has one exceptionally valuable resource. And you can look at like the Middle East with oil. Yeah, yeah. They get attacked, right? That's what happens. Like it's too important for you to get it, for you to keep it. So we're gonna invade you. Right. And so, so their their solution was not to tell anyone about it, but instead to pyramid scheme everyone into being dependent upon it. Right. So they're going to start with the salespeople who will then have access to governments and right. who will Maybe, then bring in those people one at a time. Right. And it'll basically say like, look, you have to bring in more people in order to keep getting this. And if you quit bringing in more people, we're cutting you off. And eventually everyone will be dependent upon everyone in the pyramid. Yeah. And nobody will you, be able to attack because yeah. there'll be too many people involved. And if you work hard enough, someday you can be a regional manager. Right. And then a director. A re- no, no. A, what is it? A regional, a district regional uh, <laughs> sub-manager or whatever. <laughs> assistant manager. Regional district yeah. assistant manager. Yeah, yeah. So it's a pyramid scheme and he's taking over the entire universe. The, the right. leader of this one planet is taking over the entire universe this way. Because he does mention they can't militarize. Right. They couldn't. But you think they'd be able to because I've got so many people. Hi, this is Colby, and you are listening to After Dinner Conversation, short stories for long discussions. But you already knew that, didn't you? If you'd like to support what we do at After Dinner Conversation, head on over to our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash after dinner conversation. That's right. For as little as $5 a month, you can support thoughtful conversations like the one you're listening to. And as an ad incentive for being a Patreon supporter, you'll get early access to new short stories and ad-free podcasts, meaning you'll never have to listen to this blurb again. At higher levels of support, you'll be able to vote on which short stories become podcast discussions. And you'll even be able to submit questions for us to discuss during these podcasts. Thank you for listening, and thank you for being the kind of person that supports thoughtful discussion. But you think they'd be able to because I've got so many people. But the might of the universe would... Is against them. Right. right. Yeah, would come to stop them. So he's taking over the universe in a very quiet way. Because nobody right. knows about this serum unless they're right. involved with it. Right. Unless they're one of the people yeah. who needs to do something to earn it. Yeah. Right. I mean, it. it it's... And I think that's one of the clever things about this story, right? Like, it would have been an easy enough story just to say, like, oh, there's this thing that makes you live forever. Okay, that's that asks enough interesting questions that we could we would probably publish it, and we'd have a pretty good discussion about it. But it also now asks the second question about the warning, right? About do you have a soul and what's your integrity worth? That, like, are you willing to sell your choices in life Because that's what you're doing, right? Once you're in the pyramid scheme, you have basically sold your choice, your 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 ability to choose. You can choose everything in life, but you can't choose not to sell our product anymore. Um, And so it's a way to sort of sell your integrity to be a part of the pyramid. I don't know. I thought that was a secondary sort of genius part of the story. Well, when he's talking about integrity, is he also talking about working for such a a really horrible civilization. Yes. I think he's talking about that too. Because he he mentions, he's like, these are horrible people because they couldn't even let their own people be the salespeople because they were such terrible people. Like he couldn't even trust his own people to be advocates. Right. Yeah. Does this change your opinion of the story at all now that we've talked about it a bit or it's still kind of the same? Oh, no, it's kind of, it's the same. It it asks really good questions. I found it a little bit hard to follow when I was reading it, but Mm. you guys are definitely helping the puzzle pieces come into place for me. (laughs) I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Because his pitch meanders. It does. It does. You know, and so like a good pitch would. I would have, I had to go back and read it over a few times, and I'm like, okay, I'm not really processing this right. But in talking about it, that's part of the, you know, the fun of doing these is in talking about it, it definitely makes things clearer and. It makes more sense right. now. 
Well, I think also one of the things that makes a story a little bit hard to read is you don't know what the pitch is until you're three quarters of the way into it. So you don't really know what you're getting set up for. And so the the first two thirds doesn't make a hundred percent sense until you know the mm-hmm. last bit. But then if you went back and read it, you'd understand why the conversations about integrity and about soul and all these things matter more now in the conversation. I think that this is an interesting kind of universe that the author has built. Mm-hmm. And I really would yeah. like to read a longer book. <laughs> I think it's yeah. called Dune. And it's and it's very long. It's a very long book. It's like, yeah, four big novels. Yeah. I mean, but it it's is. similar, right? Like Dune is the same thing as the Middle East. It's the same thing as like diamonds in West Africa or cobalt or whatever else. Like how does a single resource nation leverage that in a way that that continues stability, right? Hmm. I don't know. Uh, so a couple of questions for you guys. First one, uh, if you were in the narrator's position and you were handed this bottle, do you believe <laughs> the guy enough to drink to try it? Or are you like, man, this stuff's probably Jack. Here's a warning. Yeah, is this yeah. probably Jack Daniels? Like, you don't even think it's real, right? Like, how would you even know? Well, mm, I'm assuming hamster. that <laughs> so experiments on animals. Where's your integrity? Give thing? a give a thimble to the cat and see if your cat yeah. lives 35 years. I'm assuming that with it comes some sort of renewed youthful feeling. Like if you're mm. middle aged and stuff, like he was say, the salesperson was saying, like you feel the you feel you're slowing down. Like yeah, you do kind of. You feel age start start to settle in. So if you take this elixir, I would imagine that with it comes sort of a renewed energy and right. maybe Feeling your the knees of it. hurt less, you know, yeah. and it's easier to run up a flight of stairs. So Sarah, uh, two questions. Number one is is that a yes you would take it? And number two, does that mean you are, <laughs> does that mean you are in fact training for the for the half marathon in January? <laughs> I am. Nice. Actually, my, my whole training schedule is written in my calendar, and I'm supposed to uh, do, start with a couple of miles a day or every other day this week. Oh, that's so cool. I'm looking so, forward to it. Oh, me too. But yeah, I definitely think that this half marathon is going to be harder than the other ones now that I'm past 40. So Right. So are you um, a yes on the elixir? I, yeah, I don't know. I think so. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> if this is all hypotheticals. Right. Yeah. I, I think the way it's presented, you really don't have the choice with the way you're, with the pitch that you're given. Mm. Yeah. That's an interesting point. I mean, so what is it that you're really addicted to in the story? It's like the premise is that you become dependent on this. So does that mean if you stop taking it, you would die? I think well, it just clearly stops not because it's eight years later. So it's right. not going to kill you. If you, you just start aging, you again. take this one, right? You're you start aging again. Yeah. So you do have the choice to die at some point. You just stop taking it. Yeah. To resume yeah. the aging process, I would. I wonder what the author would have to say about that. That's mm. an unanswered question. What is it? Is what is it that forces people to continue taking it? Do people really? Maybe it is that people really do want to live for five hundred years. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, the chair, the chair example you bring up, Jeremy, is good though. Like. Eventually, you're, you'll have done everything. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I think that answers your question number three. What would you change about the way you live your life if you're going to live for 500 years? I mean, if and if there's no cost to it in the sense, I guess, depending on how it happens. Yeah. You know, if there's, if it isn't, you're in this club and you have to do what the leader says to be able to get it, you know, you kind of don't have a choice in what you get to do. But if it is, you you can buy this at the grocery store and live to 500. Yes, that allows you to change the way you live. Sure. And I think that's the catch on this. This is the only reason I have pause on whether or not if I drink it. Because, like, if you go to the grocery store and you could buy, like, dental floss, like, okay, then I'd probably take it. But if the only way I can get it is by selling it to other people, getting other people hooked on it. Yeah. And as soon as I quit marketing their product and bring other people into the pyramid scheme, I get cut off. You've sold a pretty important part of yourself. Now, maybe mm-hmm. not. I mean, you still have, you know, the rest of your day every day to like learn to water ski or whatever. But you 
one choice is no longer makeable, right? And that is you got to sell it to other people. Yeah, I think that with those conditions, I wouldn't want to do this. Hmm. Okay. Sarah, with those think, conditions? If it, yeah. If it comes back down to whether you, you have a choice or not, right? The way, the way you earn it is by getting other people to take it. Yeah. But May if as well you have all the time in the world heroin. to go ahead and, yeah. and, and sell it. But uh, I don't know. It's the same thing. I suppose it's the same thing with drugs, right? Like the way you get right. your heroin is by like for every 10 you sell, you get one free sort of thing. Was, or actually in this case, every well, 10 you give away. Well, you're also working for a society yeah. that basically is enslaving people. and Yeah. Step by step. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty. It's a pretty big question. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I, honestly, I, I was kind of hoping you guys would have insight on this because I was like a 50-50. Like when yeah. I when I read yes. it, I was like, I'm like a I'm like a I'm like leaning towards taking it if I could just go buy it at the pharmacy. But, I, right, I think that's the difference. I'm leaning pretty middling if I had to like be a part of the scheme. Well, I mean that's yeah. the brilliance of the story, right? Like it's an yeah. easy it's an easy question to answer if there isn't all of this other stuff attached to mm. it. <laughs> Yeah, what are the perks? The salesman really didn't give us any of the perks other than 500 years. Yeah. I suppose one of the perks is when you get a phone call, you got to answer it. Right? It's like the Godfather. Like, someday I'm going to call in a favor and you got to come. You know how we say things like, you know, uh, life's too short for this nonsense? Not anymore. Do you become more of a drama queen? Because, like... (laughs) When somebody starts drama with you, you're like, oh, wait, no, I got time for this. And you just kind of like go for it. <laughs> I, I, I wonder if it was like, I wonder if it was no longer too short for this. Let's, <laughs> let's go. Right. I have There's I've got time to waste foot. with you. I'm going to spend 10 years just commenting on Facebook posts because I have all the time in the world for this. <laughs> that's the that's the new ethical question here. Yeah. I do, you, you create an entire nation of trolls, right? basically. <laughs> so I got nothing but time to mess with you. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, just the idea of how society would change and how you would make choices differently. Like, I I don't know. I also wonder, like, remember in um, Lord of the Rings how the trees had a really long conversation with very, like, they were very slow talking and they were slow... Because they viewed things in the span of hundreds of years, right? Right. And I think that is equally probably true. Like, you probably are slow to make choices if time isn't an issue. Right. I don't know. No, that's a good point, too. How is it going to change change your behavior? I'm sure, yeah, yeah there, there are a lot of... It would change your behavior in a lot of ways. Yeah. Ways that I'm not sure we could predict. I think that's the point. All right. I was kind of hoping you guys were going to sway me one way or the other, but I'm still stuck on the fence about the thing. So I no, guess that's where I, I'm going to finish it. We're all on the fence with it. it. It kind of depends. Yeah. Oh, I Would like you... this story so much more now. Like I yeah. liked it fine when I when I was reading it, but now that we've talked about it, I like it so much more. Yeah. Would you recommend it to somebody? Would you even tell somebody else about it? Like if you got the vial and you were like, "Hey, here's what here's the pitch I got." Like I'm I, I'm on the fence. I think I'm a no, but here you go. If you want it, like it's cool. Oof. You can make the. I feel like that's a pretty cruel gift. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I've never read anything on the, the sort of the philosophy of time, but it'd be interesting yeah. to read it. And that's a, it's a double-edged gift. It's like, well, I don't like this person, but do I want them to be around for 500 years? Yeah. Even though, you know, it's, it's a terrible gift? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure I'd tell anyone. Yeah. Like, I'd like to think I just flush it down the toilet, but I don't think I'm that good of a person. <laughs> so if you don't take it, if you refuse it, do you start telling people about it anyways to warn them off of it? I think then they just, are you just, people just call you crazy? I don't you know. Really think, oh, yeah. Like, I feel like you have to have the evidence to, like, take it to, like, a science person. Right. You have to take the bottle to the FDA or, or the FDA, whatever passes right, for the right. FDA in the rim. Right, exactly. Put this in my COVID. <laughs> put this in my COVID vaccination, along with the microchip. 
Yeah. Oh, I only got 5G. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, no. You got to get the upgrade. You got to get the upgrade. <laughs> Did you get the booster? The, the, the microchip's in the booster. The microchip is in the booster. Okay. Yeah, you got you to gotta get the booster. That's where the money's at. <laughs> All right. Hey, this is a, again interesting story. I don't, I don't have anything more to add to it. It, it was a lot. To, it's a lot to unpack, but uh, we'll. But it's uh, a good story. But it's a yeah. great story. Yeah, it's a great story by. And, and I, I'll tell you one other thing. We say this about a lot of stories, but uh, I felt like it felt very, like smooth, authentically smooth. Like the dialogue didn't seem choppy. It didn't seem like it read like a book. Like it didn't read like uh, like somebody with a good idea that was trying to be a writer. Um, I don't know if that's a if that's the most eloquent way to say it, but um, I don't know. At any rate, yeah. uh, you've been listening to After Dinner Conversation, short stories for long discussion. Tahini. Uh, tahini. What is Tahini? That was her name. Oh, oh that's right. No wonder we couldn't remember her name. Uh, yeah, no wonder we couldn't remember her name. All right. So next week we have a different story. It's uh, probably... Uh, it's called Step Back by Henry McFarland, and it's about uh, a woman who has a natural pregnancy. So uh, we'll talk about that one next and uh, join us at our next session. Uh, like and subscribe, Patreon, uh, magazine, all that. I feel like I've done it so many times, but for some people, they probably have never heard all this spiel before. All right. Hey, I'll talk to you guys later. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. If you've enjoyed listening to this, please like and subscribe. Uh, it helps us out a ton. You know, the vast majority of people listen haven't liked and subscribed, which means maybe it shows up in your algorithm, maybe it doesn't. So don't leave that to chance. Just go ahead and hit that button, and we'd sure appreciate that. And uh, that way we can keep doing what we're doing, and you're not left to the whims of some algorithm. Thanks.